Welcome back, my children of rot. Did you miss me? Tell me. Did you cast your votes? Did you make your voice heard? Did you make that vital choice between Republican or Democrat? Pick your poison. The towering, antiquated elephant crashing through the wasteland of the America it is so proudly obliterated. The jackass, hopelessly progressive, bucking old-fashioned ideals just for the sake of it and trampling all beneath its self-satisfied hooves. Something deep within you speaks in hushed whispers, promising that no real difference has been made at all. That hushed whisper becomes a scream, a screaming discontent, as you realize that both parties are fear-mongering puppeteers, using sensitive public issues to pull your strings. Hey, Blockhead, I resemble that remark. I'm not trying to be offensive, Bugsy old boy, simply thought-provoking. The same I will say to you, dear viewer. Why even emperors once voted? A simple thumbs up or thumbs down sent a man to meet his maker in the mouths of lions. Cheering coliseums would watch as gladiator or Christian blood was spilt by the claws of merciless beasts. I know what you're saying to yourself. How ghastly, how obscene. But are we far removed from the days of Nero? Look at the violence between parties today, extremists driven to acts of madness, as loyal servants to that great divide between Republican or Democrat. Yes, and all the while politicians vain concern, but silently relish in the pain their devotees have wrought. Why not step into my voting booth and cast your votes for an independent party, one whose promises of change are much more swiftly fulfilled. <laughs> Tonight we will be examining travesties from the all-American political landscape. The sins of this great nation will salute the blood red, white, and blue, and together we'll crack the liberty bell like a rib. Let freedom ring! <laughs> we all have relatives of whom we seldom speak. Will Uncle Sam be one of them? Lower the flags to half-mast, for the time has come. Darken your rooms, and we shall commence. Well, it would appear Lady Audley would like to weigh in on our little political debate. Let's see what she'd like to add. Lady Liberty mourns her losses as she weeps and grieves, for all fifty of her children have turned swindlers and thieves. Their leader loots the cherished treasure of what's hidden in your mind. The glory of trust unquestioned has been misled and solace left behind. I believe Lady Audley is referring to MKUltra. MKUltra was the name given to an experimental program began in the 1950s by the American Central Intelligence Agency and the U.S. Army Chemical Corps. The scope of the MKUltra program was rather broad, but its main objective was to develop drugs and procedures for torture, interrogation, and mind control. The leader of this government program was a poison expert by the name of Sidney Gottlieb. Sidney Gottlieb, nicknamed the Black Sorcerer by his colleagues, financed psychiatric research for the development of techniques that, in his words, would crush the human psyche to the point that it would admit anything. His efforts were later not only acknowledged, but rewarded by our American government with the honor of a Distinguished Intelligence Medal. From the early 1950s through the late 1960s, unwitting U.S. and Canadian civilians underwent experimentation by the program. All forms of psychological torture were employed, including hypnosis, sensory deprivation, and the administration of illicit drugs. Millions of dollars were paid to scientists and research facilities in the form of grants for their aid in the experiments. This includes notable universities that used undergrads as guinea pigs even at the prestigious Harvard University. Amongst the students preyed upon at Harvard was Theodore John Kaczynski. Ted Kaczynski later became a serial killer, anarchist, and domestic terrorist, 
mailing pipe bombs to his victims, earning him his famous nickname of the Unabomber. It is believed that the MK Ultra experiments he underwent turned this once child prodigy into a monster. Recovered documents from the project revealed intentions to create a frequency blast titled Perfect Concussion that would wipe all memories clean. Another goal was to create a substance or program by which the victim would either age rapidly or not at all. The program also wished to create substances that would paralyze victims completely or send them into a blind panic of fear. These substances were to be administered by food, drinking water, and even cigarettes. The documents are so bizarre that some believe that a real-life Manchurian candidate was even an objective. Given the CIA's efforts to destroy all evidence and the lack of follow-up data, it is impossible to know the extent of harm inflicted by the experiments. Many deaths have been associated with the program, but most notable is the suicide of Frank Olson. Frank Olson worked for the Army as a biochemist where he was cruelly tricked into taking a massive dose of LSD. While under supervision in a New York hotel, Olson had a severe psychotic episode leaping from the 13th story window. Seemingly just another dreary suicide, right? Wrong. Olson was silenced by the CIA as he was considered a security risk. Olson only weeks before had resigned from his position after he became concerned with a program titled Project Paperclip in which former Nazi doctors were recruited for their expertise. Olson was later exhumed and an autopsy discovered he had massive cranial injuries, proving he had been knocked out before his jump. The family received $750,000 in reconciliation, hush money in other words, and a half-hearted apology from President Gerald Ford. In all, 44 colleges, 15 research associations, 12 hospitals, and 3 prisons are known participants in this travesty known as the MK Ultra experiment. Perhaps one is in your area, and the survivors still among you. Monsters made by your own government. Then the world was inhabited by a fearless breed of men. Men afraid of absolutely nothing. That's right. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely I'm sure even those monsters believe you should always honor and respect the brave men and women who are willing to defend you and your country. The same surprisingly cannot be said for the U.S. Navy, who in 1943 exposed their own sailors to the toxic fumes of mustard gas. The record states these were merely tests to measure the effectiveness of garments created to protect against this chemical agent. Sure they were. Tests apparently that needed 3,900 young men. Impressionable youth from the draft were the first to be approached for these special programs. These patriots, far from home and trusting their government, agreed to help. They were not informed of what these tests would involve until they were already trapped within testing facilities. Now, for those of you who aren't in the know, mustard gas is not quite a gas. It's a vaporous mist created from a sulfur-based family, known as a blistering agent. This chemical creates severe burns on exposed flesh and in the lungs. These men, usually only 17 or 18, were left disfigured and crippled for the rest of their natural lives. For their service, they were ignored by the Navy and then threatened by our government to keep their mouths shut. An NPR expose of the case revealed that in 2015, the Department of Veterans Affairs did not notify surviving test subjects of their eligibility for compensation and furthermore denied help to those who qualified for it. Charles Cavill was featured prominently in the NPR investigation. He fought for 26 years to receive compensation for what he was put through. He was only 19 when he and 11 other test subjects were forced inside a heated gas chamber at the Naval Research Laboratories in Washington, D.C. Their dilemma was classified, and should they try to speak out, they would have been dismissed with a dishonorable discharge. 
the records were not declassified until 1990, finally allowing the truth to be revealed. But this is a case of too little too late, as Cavill suffered from failing health for many, many years after his experience. Medical bills added up, medical bills the government refused to help with, as Cavill could not prove he was in the study. Classified, remember? How convenient for our government. Sadly, Cavill passed away in 2016 after 73 years of grief. Cavill in the NPR expose can be seen explaining how memories often come back to haunt him. There was no handle on the door. You couldn't get out. And that's what I have problems with still today. If I go to a locked door, I panic sometimes to try and get out. But this case is unquestionable fact. There are even darker rumors the Navy may one day have to answer for. It was rumored to have began in August of 1943 when the U.S. took their pursuits to win the Second World War to new extremes. The USS Eldridge and its crew were selected as test subjects for Project Rainbow. Its theory was simple, that a ship could be made invisible to enemy radar if it were surrounded in a magnetic force field. To accomplish this feat, two monolithic Tesla coils were mounted to the ship's bow and stern. Tesla coils are machines used to produce alternating currents, named after their inventor, the mad genius Nikola Tesla. Before Tesla's death, he designed machines capable of producing artificial tidal waves, particle beams that would serve as death rays, and even a contraption to communicate with the spirit realm. His blueprints and prototypes were promptly seized by the U.S. government after his passing. Coincidentally, he passed just before the experiments of Project Rainbow. Peculiar indeed. Project Rainbow was said to be a vague success, at first, but minor alterations were needed. In July of that same year, a new test was held, with alarming results. The ship itself seemed to dematerialize, becoming invisible, and in its place a strange glowing cloud of green fog hovered just above the water. Surprisingly, the ship's crew only experienced vague nausea as a side effect, so tests continued. In October, a flash of blinding blue light consumed the ship, supposedly dematerializing the vessel and rematerializing it at a naval base in Norfolk, Virginia. When the flashing strobe of blue electric lights diminished, the ship then reappeared in its intended harbor. What a remarkable accomplishment this would have been if it weren't for the deadly consequences. Upon its return, the ship was examined, revealing an oceanside chamber of horrors. The fortunate members of the ship's crew were simply driven mad. Their symptoms compared to severe fits of schizophrenia, gibbering to themselves of other dimensions and of those that exist within them. A few were found fused to the ship itself, a hideous melding of human flesh with iron, quivering masses of deformed bone and metal. This is theorized to be the consequence of molecular structures being confused together upon rematerializing. Other men from the ship literally transcended time and space fading in and out of existence, becoming invisible for a time as they were transported to realms beyond that which you can comprehend. No further testing was allowed by the Navy, as they were finally terrified by their own actions. It is said those surviving Navy men were brainwashed a la MK Ultra, or rather, that they were simply eliminated. Whatever the case may be, the secret was well kept until 1957. The whistleblower was a man by the name of Morris Jessup. He was a graduate-level researcher in the subject of anti-gravity, rockets, and the possible science of UFOs. Given his expertise, a mysterious stranger by the name of Carlos Allende contacted him. Allende claimed to have witnessed the disappearance of the Eldridge from his own ship. Jessup continued to correspond with his peculiar pen pal until he received a letter making strange mention of hypnosis explaining that Carlos was no longer available. This letter was signed by a man named Carl Allen. Not long after the letter stopped, the Office of Naval Research contacted Jessup. The ONR received a copy of Jessup's book, The Case for the UFO, in a manila envelope, marked simply, Happy Easter. In the book's margins, at length, were notes. These annotations discussed the possibility of Jessup's scientific theories the existence of supernatural beings, and stranger still, references to Project Rainbow. The handwriting in ink suggested there were three men analyzing the book together. The handwriting from one of them was said to bear an uncanny resemblance 
to that of the mysterious Mr. Carl Allen. This provoked further investigation. Just who was Carl Allen? The return address of the letter received by Jessup was traced, leading to a lonely abandoned farmhouse. In 1959, Jessup contacted a friend by phone named Dr. Manson Valentine. Jessup begged to meet with Valentine, expressing it was an urgent matter, as he had finally made a breakthrough on Project Rainbow. The following morning, he was found dead in his vehicle from carbon monoxide poisoning, an apparent suicide. Or was it? Funny how he should make a startling discovery just a day prior. A discovery the world will never know. Did someone silence Mr. Jessup with a phony suicide? Is what he knew too much to bear? Or did he finally meet the mysterious Mr. Allen? You'll never know, but I do. If you hazard the chance at winding up like Mr. Jessup, you can do your own research by digging around. Simply Google the Philadelphia Experiment. This sickening sojourn into American debacles would be remiss without mention of disease experiments. We have treated the destitute and disadvantaged as a petri dish to cultivate knowledge, but at what end? There is no crueler beast than that which feasts on the vulnerable. Our government has infected countless of unsuspecting people with diseases to examine its repercussions. There's the um, Guatemala syphilis experiment, for example, conducted during World War II. Our government wanted to combat the unexpected crisis that was plaguing our boys in uniform, the ever-embarrassing dilemma of venereal disease. Unwitting test subjects in Latin America were purposely dosed and left untreated with the disease. Men, women, and children were left to deteriorate, and their symptoms documented. Very little from the syphilis experiment exists today, as most documents were destroyed by the government shortly after the tests had reached their conclusion. The U.S. formally apologized to Guatemala and its civilians in 2011. That should make up for it, right? The side effects of radiation were tested at length to assure the Manhattan Project atomic bomb was a success. But how would you do so ethically? You don't. Staff working on the Manhattan Project were noticeably ill from their endeavors, but nothing was said. They were left with various debilitating diseases, just so the government could kick back and watch the fallout, well, so to speak. This wasn't enough. How would the atomic bomb affect general civilians? The universities of Chicago and California and the military hospital in Oak Ridge, Tennessee were called to help. The living patients were secretly injected with radioactive materials. A batch of radio sodium was sprayed from the University of Rochester's sprinklers just to see how the radioactivity was spread, with no concern for students and faculty. In Massachusetts, 57 mentally handicapped children and 100 disabled adults were fed plutonium, of all things. These tests were ran from 51 all the way through the early 1970s. The records remain sealed today, of course. So should someone still be suffering from these tests? They couldn't prove it in court. In 1965, Dr. Kligman was given a $10,000 grant by the U.S. Army and the ever-respected Johnson & Johnson Company. You know Johnson & Johnson, the same company that produced Neutrogena, Aveeno, and Lubriderm. Dr. Kligman was to study the effect of harsh chemicals on human subjects, sourcing his guinea pigs from Holmesburg Prison in Pennsylvania. After seeing the inmates trapped within the confines of their cells, he was quoted as saying, All I saw before me were acres of skin. It was like a farmer seeing fertile fields for the first time. Ugh. Most documents from the studies have been lost, but one known substance Kligman applied to naked human flesh was dioxin, the mate ingredient of Agent Orange. I can assure you, I know Kligman is roasting in hell. His flesh is eternally burning for burning flesh. <laughs> Ironic, isn't it? Increasing paranoia encouraged President Roosevelt to organize the Biological Warfare Bureau. Their tests began in 1949 hoping to measure the extent to which biological warfare may affect common civilians. Tests did not cease until 1969. They were responsible for having the Department of Defense send planes over an endless list of towns in America to spray chemicals, bacteria, and fungal spores. <laughs> San Francisco was doused with the bacteria in 1950 that sent thousands flocking to the hospital. A school in Minneapolis, Minnesota was dusted with cadmium. Even a New York subway filled with commuters was infected with pathogens responsible for food poisoning, just to see how far it might spread. 
It all seems perfectly reasonable, doesn't it, kitties? So tell me, who was your favorite president? Mm, let's see. Was it Reagan, who ignored and even hid the AIDS crisis? Was it Jefferson who paved the way for slavery? Jackson, who ordered the slaughter of Native Americans? Johnson, the speculated orchestrator of the Kennedy assassination, an advocate for the Vietnam War? Franklin Roosevelt, the mind behind Asian internment camps and the Biological Warfare Bureau? Remember, they were proud Democrats and Republicans too. <laughs> Rest easy knowing the American government will make any sacrifice for the greater good, including you. <laughs> you will have died with honor. That is, if they don't seal the records first. <laughs> I do hope you enjoy tonight's program, for you could be our next show subject of interest. Only your government can say for certain, but if I were you, I'd err on the side of caution. And as always, remember me as you scroll by. If you liked our show, then please subscribe, as we are now, so you must be. Prepare for death, and follow me.